I'm Carsten Monk, uh, I'm a board director of the Cartesi Foundation and I originally got into the mo uh, to crypto space uh, through the mobile space of all things uh, where basically I saw that the blockchain and uh, kind of like decentralized, decentralized technology can really kind of like completely change around how mobile business is done and that's kind of like how I originally started looking at it did uh, some prototypes quite early on, kind of like how blockchain and mobile device can kind of work together, and then now I'm all the way down the rabbit hole about modularity, sequence, of state availability, and all those things. Beautiful. And same question for you, please. Hi. So my name is John. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Celestia Labs, uh, and I'm there. I'm working as the director of protocol engineering. Uh, how did you get into this space? How do I get into this what space? What was the spark? Uh, my professor, when I was in college, uh, crypto pilled everyone in his research group uh, by talking about how amazing crypto was and how it was a great way to make a lot of money. And then as a poor college student, I was like, hell yeah, I want some of that. But then I tried, I tried getting into the crypto space and lost a bunch of money, as, as it were. <laughs> That's how I got started. And tell me a little bit about some of the early brushes that you had with the underlying technology, then not so much the speculative side of crypto. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the er the kind of earliest technology side of things that I got uh, that I dealt with was the uh, Ethereum virtual machine, uh, and I, I liked it because it was very uh, there was a lot of similarities between dealing with that and smart contracts, and one of my interests in university, which was compilers and interpreters. I took like half a dozen compilers classes in my graduate school. So it was, it was basically my favorite subject. Uh, ironically, not the thing that I was doing my research studies in, uh, but it was my favorite subject. And I saw a lot of similarities there and in the compiler, uh, sorry, in like the virtual machine, smart contract space, verifying that smart contracts are correct. There was a lot of over overlap there, and that's kind of where the technological interest started. And I know that some of the early research you did um, around scaling proposals ended up uh, being quite pivotal. People talk about it a lot nowadays. Can you briefly mention that? Sure. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's one for the history books. Uh, I'm sure some people see it differently. Uh, or different people have different opinions, let's say. Uh, but yes, I guess I was, I was at, after I left my graduate studies uh, at University of Toronto, uh, I joined Consensus to do research in the blockchain scaling space. So I was involved in the Plasma research that people are doing in Ethereum. Uh, we have Plasma, sidechains, state channels, that kind of stuff. Uh, and while it was a consensus, I proposed the first uh, design sketch of what one could call an optimistic rollup. Uh, obviously, it wasn't called that back then, and we didn't have the words that we have today to talk about these things. Uh, and there are many things that are similar, uh, but that was kind of the first that had these particular properties, at least that was described as such. Uh, and then basically from there, it's well, the rest is the rest is history. And here we are today, which brings me to my next question. Karsten, where are we right now and what actually brings us here to this event in Brussels? Yeah, so because one of the things that we have been maybe a little bad in, in let's say in the blockchain space, is that we've all been trying to build kingdoms and we basically should have been building all the infrastructure and all the stuff, kind of build, build this beautiful infinite gardens that, that Ethereum is talking about. And this is kind of like the spot where you know, Developer teams are kind of like starting to understand that they need to develop one thing that they're really good at and work together with other teams to kind of be compatible. For example, let's say with Celestia with data availability. Some people are dealing with execution layer like VM, like Katesi is, and other people are kind of dealing with different aspects of the stack and actually doing a good job at it. So it becomes much more kind of collaborative environment versus trying to build yet another layer one, for example. Yeah, and I think that's where uh, kind of the modular blockchain paradigm I think is very powerful. Uh, because exactly because it allows people who have specialties and interests in one particular part of the stack, uh, instead of having to build the whole stack and competing with everyone else, uh, when really we should be trying to grow, you know, grow the pie, the, the shared pie, shared modular pie. Uh, you know, with the, the modular stack, they can say, you know, if they, if they want to build something that's you know purely execution and verifying that, like you know, VM, then they can do that, uh, and then cooperate uh, with, you know. A uh, project that does, say, data availability or settlement or whatever, whatever, whatever other part of the stack you want to argue exists or doesn't exist. Uh, but then you can have situations where projects cooperate and specialize uh, within those domains, and this is a positive sum relationship. And in terms of you know bringing that relationship and, and, and sort of facilitating these collaborations between between different entities in the space, what is the function of events like this? 
I think basically, like when it comes to the kind of more modular events or things like modular summit, is basically it's a cross pollination of ideas, right? Because it might be that, let's say, so those of us who are, for example, working on the execution layer, we might have particular demands and needs and actual, let's say, being able to, let's say, synchronize up our roll ups with particular state. How do we deal with topics like archiving? It might be another project, another area is dealing with the same kind of issues. And I think it's basically just important to sit down and, and meet people and understand, kind of like, well, this is where your docs kind of suck a little bit. And kind of like tell about where the APIs are, like what what is coming in terms of like like to satisfy the problems that we are having. Clear, uh, John. There's there's two panels happening today. Can you very quickly sort of get me up to date on the main talking points that are that you think are going to be discussed at the panels? Do do you have do you think there might be any curveballs in there? No, wait. I'm not organizing these panels. I have yeah, no, I have no idea. I think I can talk about this one a little yeah. bit. Um, we had two panels. I think uh, one of them is on cross roll up interoperability and those kind of things. I might be wrong. Please cut it out if you it is, it is. But um, and then another one is about kind of like for proofs and permissionless for proofs and all the kind of like uh, the challenges and issues and so on. Because I guess that's one thing that has been explored extremely a lot in this space. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the whole zero knowledge proof stuff, but the for proof stuff. It's not completely exhausted, especially in the permissionless uh, space. So there's a uh, very strong opinion on many different sides of how can like what's the most secure or not secure, and yeah. Can you sort of um, for the non-technical people uh, among us, like myself, uh, at a very high level, why do people have strong opinions about this, and why is the disagreement there? Well, this is the blockchain space, space, and people always have strong opinions about some things, so it's especially the smallest, smallest things. But um, I think it's because that, that deep down people care about that other people's funds are safe, right? Because this is what, for example, fraud proofs are for in optimistic rollups to some extent. That it's not like there's some malicious party out there who can go out and kind of claim the computation of a rollup. Uh, ended up in a different state than it actually was. It kind of like potentially steal people's money because in another day, like like. Um, uh, those of us who are in this space, like, let's say our grandma has some F sitting on Arb Arbitrum or some F sitting on Optimus, we kind of don't want them to get hacked because it looks bad on us no matter what. So this is kind of like why it's important that fraud proofs are kind of debated and we understand what's kind of like the practical problems or kind of like things we need to watch out for. But I, yeah, I saw you and, I can, there. I, and I can expand on that. Please. Uh, so just like ZK proofs, fraud proofs uh, also have different trade offs. And there's many different styles of fraud proofs with different trade offs. Uh, and these trade-offs aren't necessarily that one is strictly better than the other in all respects. Uh, often the, these are like strict trade-offs where it's like you're giving up something to get something else. Uh, and in such cases, uh, a lot of the kind of is this better than the other is not an objective thing. It's what is the community behind these projects, what do they most value? Because communities you know, between these different projects aren't necessarily entirely homogeneous. They can have different things that they hold dear or that they think are more important than others. Uh, you know, they may agree for 99% of their things, and they may have, have slight differences. You know, things like maybe they don't like the government regulation or whatever, or over-regulation, let's say. Uh, but you know, they like the concept of decentralization, and self-custody, and blah, blah, blah. So like 99%, maybe you know, they're in agreement. Uh, and then there's minor differences. Uh, so to give you kind of like a very, uh, very obvious, like very obvious difference between two things that are not fraud proofs, but that are ZK proofs, for example, because this one is like completely easy to understand. Uh, with fraud proofs, some of the differences can be subtle. But with ZK proofs, for instance, you have Starks and you have Snarks. Uh, Snarks have a trusted setup, but usually are very small and cheap to verify. And then Starks, okay, they don't have a trusted setup, uh, but they can be very large and expensive to verify. Uh, neither of these things is necessarily strictly better than the other. Right? It depends on what you value. Are you okay with a trusted setup? Because if you as a community, or you as a person in a community, is okay with a trusted setup, uh, especially one that is, let's say, updatable, and one in which you can participate in, uh, so, that, so you yourself are, you know, it's trustless for you, if you participate in this, uh, then why not, use, why not use a snark? It's better because it's smaller, right? But you may be, you know, off the camp that this trusted setup should not exist. And there's many reasons why, you know, that is a good argument. Uh, and in such a case, then the community can converge around Starks and say, okay, no trusted setup, and we accept the trade-off that these are larger and more expensive, uh, but they don't have a trusted setup. Similarly, you know, fraud proofs. You have things like single round. You have uh, multiple round fraud proofs. You have, you know, how do our timeouts reached? Uh, there's a whole bunch of parameters there uh, that can subtly change the trade-offs in a, a fraud proof. Uh, and again, one is not necessarily strictly better than the other, and this is what leads to a bunch of people 
debating each other and like yelling at each other on Twitter and stuff. But you think overall that this, this sort of um, divergence of opinions creates healthy discussions or? Oh, it depends. <laughs> it, it, it depends what's happening. If it's on a panel in a conference, probably it's very healthy. If it's late night at Twitter, not necessarily always. But I, but I think it's also like the whole discussion is also uh, that uh, when we have, let's say, for example, a very, very big roll up, like for example, let's say Arbitrum versus, let's say, many small, uh, for example, sovereign roll or something mm -hmm. like that, or kind of like small application change, then like a dynamic dynamics of the security that's needed is also changing. Mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of like where maybe the debate is because you can't demand that somebody puts down a security deposit of a billion US dollars to probably secure a small roll up that runs your SimCity game or something like that. Clear. Um, I want to ask you about some of the, the challenges um, that, that entities in this space uh, face in achieving cross roll-up interoperability, and specifically, how have you come across these challenges and how are you addressing them? So, I think basically, like, where when we are as users nowadays, we are play, playing around with Ethereum, I mean, the, the UX for bridging and kind of like working across, let's say, even different uh, lay roll-ups or layer tools in the Ethereum space, the experience is just horrid, right? I mean, uh, there's even songs about how bridging sucks, right? Um, and I, I think that, that if we need to get into this kind of like like UX where, let's say, normal people, like in terms of kind of like how they do payments or how they do, or do, or do with, let's say, um, deal with... Um, deal with payments and all kind of like flows of uh, information or value or ownership and so on and it becomes like it's just not acceptable today when everybody's running around with an iPhone mm -hmm. I don't want to have to kind of navigate with 12 words uh, on my phone and so yeah. on as well so yeah, have you have you found the same thing have you similar challenges in terms of you know getting the technology to be adopted yeah like fra fragmentation is kind of the big issue when dealing with multiple domains and bridging between domains uh, I guess the, one of the big challenges is getting people to agree on a standard. Uh, because if, if we all agreed on a standard, we could have much better bridging today. The problem, of course, is that when people design these protocols for cross-chain bridging, uh, invariably there's going to be certain shortcomings, uh, certain cases that are not covered. Uh, you know, for, for example, you have some protocol that assumes that the state of one chain is a Merkle tree. And I was like, well, it's, I don't use a Merkle tree, I use, uh, I use a KCG commitment, for instance, right? Or maybe I don't use a Merkle tree at all. Maybe I just do what Slana does, and I just, just don't, have, don't, don't have a state root, right? Uh, and in such cases, these protocols, now they don't work. Uh, so it's a situation where uh, you know, the, it's hard to get people to agree on a standard. And that's one of the biggest challenges. Well, not just in building bridges, but just building anything. But I guess that's why we're having these conversations, right? And, and that sort of brings me nicely onto my next question. Would you argue that the way at Celeste you've, you've approached modularity is unique as a result of your sort of frustration with uh, you know, missing standards, missing agreements? Mm, I don't know it's unique because of that, but I would say it's unique uh, in the sense that uh, Celestia kind of approaches things from a perspective of uh, modular perspective. Yeah, they're really, they're really good at what they do, right? I mean, that's that's basically it. And but and why? Why have you had to do things in a slightly different way, or why have you had to improve on the previous standards? Why did you decide to do things the way you do in a technical sense? Oh, okay, well. So yes or no, in the sense that uh, just because Celestia isn't built on Ethereum, for instance, doesn't necessarily mean that it decided on new technical standards. Uh, it wasn't built as a sidechain on Ethereum because in order to do data availability sampling, and in order for that to be useful, it needs to be the base layer of things that are built on top of it. So for instance, you couldn't have Celestia be a sidechain to Ethereum and then provide that data availability security to a rollup also on Ethereum. Right? It would have to be on top of Celestia, the sidechain. Which, you know, at that point, you just make it a layer one, which is what it is. Uh, but it did not reinvent the wheel in terms of standards. Uh, for instance, uh, Celestia is, not for instance, but in actuality, Celestia is built on top of the Cosmos SDK uh, because that, uh, you know, that development uh, framework has a large number of primitives, including ones that are good for bridging, such as IBC. You now it's constantly being improved by the IBC team. Uh, you know, to support things like you know different statement schemes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's not a pro static protocol. It's, it's the bridging protocol is constantly being improved, 
uh, and all these things are adopted by the celestial state machine. So, you know, if you can plug it in directly into the Cosmos ecosystem and all the ecosystems for which these kind of adapters to the IBC protocol have been written to, such as Ethereum as well. And how does that link up with interoperability? The, the way decisions are being made, strategies being executed, how does it contribute to interoperability? I'll do that first. Yeah, first. <laughs> but I, 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 think, I think basically because of, the, for example, the way the Celestia is designed in terms of like with connecting so much with Cosmos. I mean, Cosmos is all about, let, let's say, uh, bridging, kind of like doing the consensus part much better. Might be a little bit wrong on this, but you know. Um, and we're also seeing in the Ethereum space that, that things are kind of becoming a little bit, let's say, cosmosy fight in this regard, that we are kind of starting to realize that there's actually lots of good innovation and thought in this space as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have completely seen uh, the full spectrum of kind of like what is possible if you combine it last year with other technologies uh, mm -hmm. like this, especially in the Ethereum space, because connecting things into, let's say, the EVM can be a bit of a headache once in a while. And we kind of like have to be sort of like sub suboptimal versions and so on. There's of course something where we are Catesi, where we have, for example, let's say a Risk Five burst based uh, virtual machine that can essentially run Linux, might make some of these things easier to express. Uh, but um, these kind of things are still kind of like to be seen how exactly this pans out in how Ethereum based chains will work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the nice things about the Cosmos stack is that. Uh, because of the Cosmos vision of having many chains instead of just one monolithic chain, which was more like the you know Solana and Ethereum vision, uh, despite the fact that you know you may say that uh, the Ethereum vision is now modular, uh, there's it's still like a you know a single a single stack, not multiple stacks. Uh, uh, but the Cosmos vision is different, right? The Cosmos is like, hey, you're gonna have many chains and they're gonna interoperate. And because of that, a lot of the bridging primitives, not just IBC, but all the things that, you know, that are available in the SDK, uh, the bridging is a first-class primitive on Cosmos chains, including Celestia, uh, in a way that is not a first-class primitive on things like Solana or the Ethereum virtual machine or any EVM-based chain. Uh, and because of that, it means that you have a much easier time uh, building bridges to other chains, but also building bridges it, up and down the stack because there's already existing standards there. What have, in that case, building on, on that response, the most significant advancements been in the last you know, 12 to 24 months in creating a situation where we can actually have this conversation? Hmm. It is, it is a very good question. Um, but I think like like one of the things that has really grown, and especially because of, let's say, events like Modularity Summit, uh, Modular Summit? Modular Summit. Modular Summit. Modular Summit. Um, has been that, let's say, that, that people have become more aware of each other and been more kind of like daring to go into the space because it's, it's kind of like, like it's different, difficult to paint the picture of, of how this modular world is supposed to look if you're not there together with the other pieces of the stack, right? And there's definitely been many kind of like advances in how do we deal with, let's say, getting uh, good data availability in the hands of people. Uh, we are not there completely yet, in my opinion. Uh, more understanding about what sequencing means exactly, more, of, more about kind of like how does, let's say, uh, astrochronia and circonique work in this space. And we're kind of like, we're kind of like just scaling it up at this point um, and actually getting these things to main that because in the end of the day, like, like if I can just play with your amazing new modular technology and test that, I can't take it to production. <laughs> and it's a bit of a headache. Yeah, so to kind of expand on, mm -hmm. uh, to expand on that answer, uh, I think one of the kind of soft things that has kind of came out of this modular philosophy, uh, as opposed to like a hard technological advancement, is exactly you know people talking more, uh, talking to each other as opposed to just building on their own. Uh, and this is most evident actually in this year's ETCC during this week, where very few people attended the main event because there are all the side events. And I would contend that actually the side events aren't side events but all of them together are the main event. They're modular events. They're different events in a modular event stack, uh, as opposed to the previous monolithic approach. Uh, so this kind of philosophy of you know, having a modular blockchain stack, I would say potentially contributed to what we're seeing this week at ECC, where you have a bunch of events, and people are going and cross-pollinating ideas at a bunch of these events, all sharing ideas instead of only converging into one place. And just to continue building on that then, how, how do you see 
blockchain scalability evolving um, with the implementation of cross rollup interoperability and what role do you feel Celestia will play in that? I mean, as, as cross rollup interoperability and bridging improves, then that's only going to make it more the modular blockchain thesis, not just for Celestia, but for the entire blockchain space, more appealing. Because uh, fragmentation is one of the big challenges right now. So the more that gets resolved, the more that, get, that issue becomes alleviated, uh, the more appealing having multiple execution environments on top of shared data layers is going to look like. Uh, and you know, Celestia is going to hopefully play a key role uh, in, such, in such a world, being you know, the first modular data availability layer, uh, doing things like putting security first uh, as opposed to other data layers that are basically just AWS or a Google form. Uh, you know, Celestia being the only one, the only data availability layer live currently that has data availability sampling, and I launched with it, stuff like that. So I'd expect Celestia to be a key player in this uh, in this new world. I see you nodding there. I want to ask you if if you agree fundamentally, and maybe more importantly, if you can point to any specific developments or, or projects that are in the pipeline that are really contributing to that. I think basically, like in the end of the day, like like when you're looking at kind of like the choices to be made, I don't think there's a winner takes it all because in the end of the day, the developers are well. If we believe in let's say the million, app, let's say different app rollups and so on, then they'll make different choices, right? Some of them might be perfectly happy with something like Excel, you know, people might be happy like with Expresso, or so like other kind of like things where they kind of like fulfill things what they need. But in the end of the day, unless we can get the UX working in a way where we don't have the last or five, seven years of MetaMask kind of like experiences, then we're not, not going to be for anything, right? So we really need to figure out how to make this work in a proper way. And I want to then sort of segue into my, my question about, you know, L2 bridging experiences because, uh, you know, obviously, aside from the UX, um, they can just be quite cumbersome for a lot of people. Um, can you explain how Intense can maybe revolutionize cross-chain user experience for rollups? Sure. Uh, so intents, I guess, are something that is coming back into excitement in the past few weeks or so. Uh, it was extremely exciting a year ago. People were super hyped about it, and then it kind of went up, went off the narrative. They kind of went off the narrative train. Uh, I think maybe in part because this module of the blockchain eco ecosystem and the notion of having a bunch of different domains that interact with, with each other instead of one domain ta that takes it all. Uh, you know, as it became more obvious that that was not the case and that there, we would have multiple domains, multiple execution environments that would have to cooperate, uh, I think the idea of Intense came back into popular focus. Uh, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things you can do with Intense is, you know, express some desire uh, programmatically and then have that desire be fulfilled and then you pay for it or not fulfilled uh, mm -hmm. if it can't be. Uh, or if you don't put up enough, you know, payment to pay for something that will satisfy some solver network to you know to fulfill, fulfill this fulfill this uh, intent. Uh, and the nice thing about this is it doesn't require you know if this pro intent protocol is properly constructed, then it makes it much easier and it reduces the requirements on users to do things across domains. Like you can specify that these two things need to happen autonomously. Like I do some payment on this chain, and then I get an NFT on this chain. And then you can do that atomically. And that's one of the very powerful things that Intense allow you to do. Would you like to add to that? Um, I, I think basically that, that deep down, I think we have not just, let's say, with Intense, we have kind of like a UX problem to some extent there, but I think that we have still major, major challenges in key management and all those kind of different things for people and how exactly we manage these things or even present what's going to happen to users. Mm -hmm. And I think things are not completely solved yet in that regard. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is going to be, but but at least with the modular thing, there's a, there's a potential that there might be a standard emerging around some of these things to kind of like make things work. Like like even with, let's say, with, for example, the, the different worlds of Ethereum and uh, and Cosmos kind of like, wait for Kepler kind of and MetaMask, like it, it's, it's, uh, it's still a mess. Uh, I like that, uh, that, that take on it, it's still a mess. I think there's a fair amount of consensus around the idea that things are still quite messy. Um, so, Carsten, when we think about adoption, you know, the, the, the term next billion users gets mm -hmm. thrown around a lot. But when we talk about adoption and, and the broader integration of blockchain technology into everyday applications, both by people and enterprises, you say it's a mess, we're clearly not there yet. What are the key sort of factors that both developers and founders need to pay attention to? Um, and, and maybe we can sort of tie this uh, and make it in terms of cross rollup interoperability. I think basically the most important thing for founders and product users out there is eating your own dog food. 
and actually tried to spend, uh, uh, let's say, actually tried to spend some time with this technology of building, testing it out, seeing how it feels, and people seem to, seem to kind of forget it, like they put on a white paper and then they implement it and then kind of forget it after that. Um, this is one of the things, for example, I liked a lot, for example, about F Denver and kind of like the early years. They drew every single kind of like Web3 experience at you, like no matter how broken it was, and I think it actually advanced things quite a bit. But in terms of adoption, like um, the thing about the next billion users kind of thing, like I would, I come from originally from kind of kind of like from mobile OS kind of thing. We said next billion users is people in Africa and so on, and I think that it's more important that that we get to a point where the technology fades into the background, mm. right? And that, that that's kind of like what we need to get to at this point, that we are running out of excuses about why things are so messy. What what, what do you think about that? Could you repeat the question? Yes. Um, so in terms of adoption and getting the next billion users here, obviously things are messy. Things aren't quite um, where we think they were going to be. If we you know, sort of put ourselves back five years ago, um, everyone would have probably guessed that there would be a lot more adoption in sort of everyday use by individuals and enterprises. Um, what do we need to do? And can you maybe tie what we need to do for adoption into cross-chain uh, cross interoperability? Uh, sure. So, what do we need to do for adoption? Uh, we need to lower the barrier to entry, which is obviously, I mean, that's obvious. That's obvious in the sense that you have to one of the one of the things is you have to lower the barrier to entry. The second thing is you need to make a thing that people will want to use. Obviously, if people want to use a thing but it's hard to use, they won't use it. Uh, and if there's nothing for interesting for them to do, then you know, it doesn't matter if there's no barrier to entry, they just won't do it. You know, kind of like you know, if you have an app, if you say, okay, I can download, you know, you download an app from the App Store, uh, but it doesn't do anything interesting, you know, no one's going to download it. Uh, but if you make a very interesting app, but it costs like $20 to, to buy, well, maybe you won't have that many users versus if you make it free and monetize it in some other way. Uh, you know, similarly, I think if we, we want to get it into a situation like you know, phone application penetration, uh, like market penetration here that I'm talking about, uh, you need those two things. Um, it's debatable whether or not we have an application that people want. You know, there's things like speculating and hedging against runaway inflation from the U.S. government. Possible, maybe. Uh, there are stablecoin transfers, which actually are like a very successful and popular application of the blockchain. Uh, po possibly like the, the most by a significant margin, especially in you know uh, poorer countries, th third world countries, and so on like that. Uh, and then you know the other side is lowering the barrier to entry, and that's half of it is fees, the cost of doing things. The other half is UX. Mm -hmm. And specifically, what are you working on um, technologically and strategically that you can sort of point to in the next 12, 24 months uh, that is advancing that? At the very least, I can talk about from the you know, Celestia base layer infrastructure perspective, uh, fees and the cost of doing things uh, is something that you know, Celestia and the modular blockchain stack is hoping to alleviate. Uh, so one of the kind of primary goals uh, that is being worked towards by the Celestia community is abundance of block space. So to have one gigabyte blocks, not just, and not, that's not you know, the end state, but rather that's just a stepping stone to even larger blocks. Mm -hmm. So it's to have an abundance of block space that is also secure, that is, you know, has all the guarantees that you're, that you're used to and that you want out of a blockchain, uh, uh, but you know, make it abundant to drive down fees and allow a large number, not just drive down fees, but drive down fees and allow a much larger number of users to use the protocol at the same time. Yeah, I'd sure. just uh, like to add a little bit also to Please. the bar barrier of entry here. It's also very important the barrier of entry for developers is, is lower because like, I think we kind of like maxed max out just how many people we can get suckered into writing Solidity at this point. Um, and this is also why what we are doing in Katesi is quite important because it's a Linux environment essentially. If you can mm -hmm. put it into a Docker container, deploy it to something like Versal or something like that, then probably it also works in a Katesi machine. And kind of making the barrier of entry much easier for people to actually build interesting applications because like, why haven't we seen, let's say, let's say uh, SimCity light -like games uh, running on top of something like Celestia by now? Uh, why haven't we seen more complex kind of things? Because we ended up in this thing in, even since uh, 2018, every single little smart contract was a startup with at least five contracts, a smart contract in a couple of PD people and so on, while it should have been one person sitting in a garage somewhere writing an amazing application and pouring it to the world. 
and what are you working on that you can point to in the next uh, 12 to 24 months in that area? I know you're going to continue organizing events like this, which is obviously quite pivotal mm -hmm. in you know, having these conversations and bringing it to the forefront so people are aware of the developments. So I think basically, like um, this is again about the, the building the kingdoms, right? Because like we have these amazing data availability layers, but having just another, let's say, EVM-based chain on top of them is not enough. We need to have something that actually pushes the developers into it, which is where we kind of like see our role in Cartesi as like, this is where we get making it easy for developers. Just sit down, write, uh, create a template, edit your Python or your PHP if you are that way inclined, write your application, deploy it, choose what kind of data availability you want to have for it, add bridges to it, and it just works. I mean, that's where it needs to get to. And my final question then is, for both of you, why should people sign up to and attend the upcoming Cartesi events? What can they learn from you? I think basically from Cartesi point of view in this particular case and uh, is that we're kind of like, let's say, the, the entry point for developers because this is maybe the problem to some extent for, let's say, other parts of the modular stack, like like where do the developers actually come in, right? Because like, yes, I can interface with something like Celestia's so RPC because I'm a developer, but it's not really the, the area where I'm doing my business. So I we feel that kind of like by some of these events, we can kind of bring people together to discuss and focus on kind of like how does it look like for developers and making it easier for people. And for yourself, John, what are you hoping to get from these events? I'm hoping to meet some interesting people. Sure. Thank you very much both for your time. Thank you.